just to break it down for people, then we'll get into what the experiments are showing so far. What we have here is a unique population of humans, not rats, not hamsters, not snakes or C. elegans, with, quote, elevated LDL and ApoB particles who are, quote, healthy with insulin sensitivity and have a lean body mass index. And they are phenotypically, they look different than people who generally have high LDL and they look different physiologically at the level of the macrophage and their genetics from people with familial hypercholesterolemia. And so the question of the study that we're, that you and your team are embarking on is, do these people with elevated, significantly elevated LDLs have the same increased risk of cardiovascular disease? Do they progress with atherosclerosis the way a baseline population would? And so this is an interesting experiment to do because if ApoB, containing lipoproteins cause atherosclerosis, there's no reason they shouldn't, right? So I'll let you take it from here and talk about the experiment and correct anything I said up to this point. No, definitely. So, okay. <clears throat> so taking it back to 2019, I, at that, at that point, after a couple of years of knocking on the doors of lipidologists and just trying to get a study going uh, through the quote unquote traditional routes, I decided to just go ahead and form a science uh, foundation and we raised the money ourselves, crowdfunding, as, as you know. I, I, and thank you, by the way, to anybody who's watching this right now who helped to contribute to the Citizen Science Foundation to make this thing happen. That's literally what happened. We, we got enough donations from individuals to just fund this study. And so what we do is here's the Citizen Science Foundation. Over here is the Research Institute. That's the Lundquist Institute. They're the ones that actually conduct the study. We help recruit the people for them. They then do the scans and then all the data and the analyses are in-house. And this study was set up. We um, had talked to Dr. Matt Budoff, who's our principal investigator, to understand how uh, the technology works. The technology is CT angiography. And what they're doing is they're doing a scan of the soft and calcified plaque in the arteries. And it's an extremely high resolution. It has, a, it has a spatial resolution of, I believe it can see plaques down to one millimeter or even smaller in some cases. And it, in the way that they're doing is that they're going through like readers, it's like in 3D, uh, they can go through and actually spot any and all of the plaques, the stenosis, and a whole bunch of other metrics that they can gather. Well, we're getting 100 of these folks that meet our eligibility criteria, which are about borderline lean mass hyperresponders from what I was mentioning before. And scanning them at day zero, and then scanning them again about 365 days later. So it's about a year apart. When we were originally doing this, we thought we'd need five years. Uh, but actually, uh, these CCTA um, studies, they're often very short because you really can see the change that rapidly. And so because of the exposure, I mean, because our population is in the top 99.9% .9 of LDL for the population, yeah, there's, I mean, they're, they're hypercholesterolemic, unquestionably. The, like, think of the, the same thing I just mentioned to you just now, the children of Brown and Goldstein. You could easily have put them into one of these scanners, uh, not that we would, because they're very young, <laughs> but if you looked two years apart, you would have seen a massive change. I don't think anybody would have bet otherwise, right? Okay, so with that said, we're getting the study started and I'm a little depressed because it turns out there's really, even though we don't have a control, there's really no healthy control groups that are out there, especially healthy populations for which there's already longitudinal data, especially. And I was just, it was very depressing. But what I didn't know at that time was that this other study called Miami Heart was taking place elsewhere. Uh, the principal investigator is Karam Nasir, fantastic guy. And I'm so thankful he started this thing because it's a much larger population. I believe it's 2,400, 2,500, something like that. And that's going on and it's completing right near the time that we become aware of it. And then I, I go, oh, well, we could do a match analysis. Um, that was one of the things we had talked about early on. And that was, that was a crucial point because I believe it was, I believe it was Matt who initially brought it up in an interview. And at the time that I was interviewing him, and said that, said, of course, we don't have any healthy people to, mat to connect it with. He's the one who said, well, no, we can do match, match controls. And at that time, he knew about Miami Heart and I did not. 
And so needless to say, right after that, I was like, okay, well, even though we have the longitudinal study that's going to happen anyway, if there's a point in time where the match analysis is possible, let's do it. And that's what happened next. So basically since what the last, I don't know, we actually kind of got this rolling in February, but there's a lot of process that's involved with it. Um, finally, the match analysis was able to happen. Uh, the biostatistician inside of Lundquist uh, carefully uh, did a match. And what they do is they're, um, let me let me back up a step. We have the 100 participants at baseline and they by February have all been scanned, right? For their first of those tests. They've all been scanned, all 100. But the catch is that um, 20 of those are outside of the age ranges of the uh, Miami Heart cohort. So that's still plenty that we had 80. So of those 80, Lundquist's statistician needs to try to see if there's a matched cohort. Can it get matched for age, uh, gender, uh, ethnicity, all of these things? And, and it was a, a very surprising one-to-one match. Like uh, if, if you see the, uh, the table at some point, it's, it's really impressive. The key differences are, of course, the LDL, which is what we wanted to be different. Uh, BMI was different. I want to say our BMI for our cohort was 22.5, which won't surprise you at all. Gets back to the whole lipid energy model, everything else. And I think on the Miami hard side, it was, I want to say 25.8. Uh, but all the healthy markers, otherwise, everybody's got a very comparable uh, smoking status, blood pressure, HSRP, uh, A1C. They're, they're so close for a match. And I love that because I, I, like, one to, I like stratification over modification wherever possible. So if you can actually get a match group, that's fantastic. Um, and both groups, very high uh, HDL, very low triglycerides. So finally, the analysis is done. And we found out you know, a few months ago, but of course, we had to stay under the embargo until Matt Buda presented it this last Friday. So yes, um, I have, I actually have his uh, slide deck over here now. The results were the matched mean age was 55.5 years. Uh, that's, that's super relevant to me because frankly, I kind of was looking forward to the possibility we might have middle age population because they're going to be more likely to have plaque than not. Um, and the mean LDLC of our group was 272, 272. So it's actually about per inhanes. That's about one in a thousand people have an LDL that high. It's extremely rare. And the mean uh, time on the diet, so the mean time likely to be at these levels, is around 4.7 years. So almost half a decade, they were at these levels. And there was no significant difference in coronary plaque burden compared to Miami Heart Controls, who had a mean LDL of 123 milligrams per deciliter. Um, I was... Well, you have to repeat that for emphasis. That was, like, yeah. like, that was yeah, the most sorry. important part. <laughs> yeah, sorry. The, there, was, there was no significant difference. Say it louder in, for the people in the back. <laughs> no significant difference in the coronary plaque burden as compared to Miami Heart Controls. So between those two populations, there was no statistically significant uh, difference. What, what did surprise me, and it comes with caveats when I say this, so hear my whole sentence, right? If the area under the curve were reversed, where those who are on the keto side, it was statistically non-significant, but trending up compared to Miami Heart. I think many people would conclude, okay, so maybe they're, maybe they're not there yet. It's a slower process, but that's where they're headed. So that's the only reason I bring it up. I don't want to give the impression that uh, the people in our group are just straight up doing better. Because again, it's not statistically significant, but it does lead me to believe that they're not trending toward worse thus far. And I, I think that's a responsible way of sort of putting that. But then there's another thing that's super important that I really was looking forward to because now we had a large spectrum of LDL levels between both groups, right? So you, you had in our group, the LDL, of course, uh, could be as low as as 190, or I think even uh, possibly lower in some cases. 
going up to as high, the, the person with the highest was 591 milligrams per deciliter, their LDL. So it's almost 600, right? And now you could correlate that against the TPS, the total plaque score. So how much did LDL correlate to the total plaque score? And you can see that in the graph pretty easily. There's no correlation. There's no correlation in our group or in the Miami Heart group. There's just no correlation between uh, detected uh, LDL levels at baseline and uh, resulting plaque, which again would counter expectations um, if looked at context independently. So that's, that's basically the core of the results. That's awesome. So let me just reiterate that for people. So we have in your group, 80 people out of the 100 who you can find age match controls for at Miami heart who have been on a ketogenic diet with low carbs and elevated LDL an average of 272 milligrams per deciliter, a hundred out of a hundred cardiologists prescribing statins for those people before they walk out the door, but those people are not on statins. And they've been on this diet for an average of 4.7 years. So this is not a short amount of time. And as you said earlier, the interesting thing about CT coronary angiogram is that it's very sensitive. This is different than a CAC, than a coronary artery calcium score, something that I've talked about in the past that I did on myself. I've never had a coronary CTA, so it's something I want to do in the future. So the, the C the coronary, the CT coronary angiogram looks at both calcified and soft plaque. There was some misunderstanding about this online, apparently, and you can be very sensitive. So even the fact that you have baseline data on these people now gives you how much plaque burden is there in a group of people with an average LDL of 272 milligrams per deciliter for an average of 4.7 years. And you see some, but when you, when you compare that to an age match control from Miami Heart, it's, there's no statistically significant difference. So relative to a group of people who have a much lower LDL, the amount of plaque burden is essentially at a statistical level equivalent. Though, as you're noting, your group is trending lower. There's not enough power in the study with only 80 to 80 comparison to make that a statistically significant difference, but you have a trend toward lower, which is incredible. And if you are able to share the slides with me, I'll put some of the slides from your presentation up on this podcast on YouTube so people can see this. There's no correlation between the level of LDL and the plaque burden in either of these two groups, presumably in Miami Heart. It's because it's also a group of people who are relatively healthy and have other proxy metrics suggesting they are insulin sensitive. Your group we know has low triglycerides, high HDL, part of this triad that we've looked at, proxy marker of insulin sensitivity. So this is pretty interesting because as we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, and this is my words, not yours. If ApoB causes atherosclerosis, then why does your group with a very elevated LDL for an average of 4.7 years not have a statistically significant, I would say markedly different, greater plaque burden than an age match control for Miami Heart with lower amounts of LDL? Now, the other piece of the equation for people to understand is that this is not the completion of the study. This is a really important time frame. You're going to scan your people out a year to look at their progression. But in some ways, the data we have now is just as important as the, the next part. They're both equally important. You're going to look at progression at a year. But right now, we can say versus an age match control, your group is actually trending lower, not statistically significant, but it's trending lower. How can that be if ApoB is causal in atherosclerosis? 